Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about um, this this idea of, of of doing spectral analysis of NBA data. I'll tell you what that means, um, and uh, I'm going to apologize in advance for for having like slightly math heavy slides at the beginning. Um, but but you can just ignore them, and then we'll get into like the real basketball questions uh, pretty pretty shortly. So. Um, all right, so let's get going here. Um, okay, so I'm going to start um, by by just sort of um, uh, imagining this or, or thinking a, a little bit about this this um, idea of, of what Fourier analysis is, um, and this is just a, a kind of really standard um, approach to analyzing data in in science. So uh, imagine that you're observing a function at some some time intervals, so equally spaced time intervals. Uh, so a, a, a nice example might be um, maybe you're in a big city and you're just counting up how many babies are born each day of the year. So you're, you're, you're just observing a number uh, for each of the 365 days in a year. <coughs> and so you might get uh, a signal that looks like that and you might wonder, um, you know, well that's kind of a noisy signal, um, you know, what, what goes into that signal? How can you separate signal from noise here? Uh, and what Fourier analysis does is it, it, it essentially asks for periodicities. So it says, you know, maybe there are weekly trends in that birth data. Maybe there are monthly or seasonal trends in there. Um, and so what we might do is, is take a look at uh, whether or not we can, we can find these kind of nice periodic functions in that signal. Um, and that's really um, what Fourier analysis is all about. So you move from the time domain, so we have a function essentially um, that, that just gives you a value, which is the number of births for, for each of the days of the year, and you move over into a different domain, which is the frequency domain, okay, where you're just looking at periodicities. And here you can you can you can they, they jump right out at you. You can say, well, look, here's a here's a, a, a huge spike in this signal that happens around 12, so that's something that's going to oscillate about 12 times a year. So that's your monthly signal. And then there's another signal that spikes here around 52, so that's going to be a, an oscillation that's going to happen weekly. So there's 52 oscillations there in a year. Uh, and those, those signals on the right just go with those, with those signals on the left. So the, the fundamental idea that I just want to point out uh, so, so I just I apologize for that slide, but but the the idea is just that that um, what you do is you take a simple function which is just looking at how many babies are born on each day of the year, you you move from from this representation of that data to another representation of that data where there's some insight to be to be had by expanding that function in a different basis. Okay, so the idea is that. Um, if you want to understand this function, you might rather try to, to think about how it's built out of periodic functions, and there's something to be learned there, looking at that signal that way. That's the, the starting idea, or the foundational idea of Fourier analysis. Okay. <clears throat> and under the hood, those periodic functions happen to be very well known, well understood things. There are periodic functions on a particular mathematical object called a group, uh, and you can kind of think of the year as, as a circle and, and everything, you know, there's, there's some nice math there that we'll, we'll exploit later. Okay, so here's our, here's our basketball question. Um, so, so I think just um, kind of an in interesting question uh, to think about in basketball, and I know lots of people have thought about this, is um, there's this idea, you know, that basketball is a team sport, and that somehow a, a lineup uh, is, is more or less than, than the sum of its individual parts. Uh, so there's, you know, obviously uh, Kevin Durant is a pretty great player, um, but somehow pairing Kevin Durant up with Steph Curry and Clay Thompson, there's, 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 there's some additional benefit there. Um, so, so that's the question that we want to think about. If you account for both of the individual contributions, for example, um, is, is there actually added value from a Clay Thompson, Steph Curry pairing, <coughs> or is that just two individually great players playing at the same time? 
that's kind of the, the question that we want to ask. And we're going to think about that as, as um, what we'll call, or what I'll call, a, a second order contribution. So if you, if you had the ability to pull out the individual contributions of those two individuals, um, is there still value added from the, the pairing as a pure second order contribution? And then you can kind of keep walking up and say, well, what about groups of three? And what about groups of four? And what about groups of five? OK. All right. Um, and then the other question that, that at the very end I want to get into uh, is you know, how, even if you, if you kind of knew that, what can you do with it? Um, probably it's not going to be a, a total shock that Steph Curry and Clay Thompson are both good, and they're both good when they play together. Um, but you, you still have to, you know, uh, rest those guys, and there are players like Sean Livingston who are kind of important players for a team like the Golden State Warriors, and it might be nice to know if there are players that, that pair particularly well with Sean Livingston or pair particularly poorly with Sean Livingston. So we'll kind of come back to that question in a few minutes. Okay. Uh, so, well, what's a lineup? All right. Well, a lineup is, is essentially just an unordered group of five players which automatically determines another unordered group of, say, 10 players if we fix our roster to be 15 guys. Uh, so those are the guys who are on, those are the guys who are off. And you know what you do as you sort of change lineups is you just introduce substitutions. Players get cycled in, cycled out. Okay? Um, so from the perspective of understanding team success, we might uh, take the, the following sort of abstract approach. If you have a 15 person roster and you label your players from 1 to 15, uh, then a lineup is just the specification of the five guys that are on the floor. And you can measure that lineup success. Uh, so I have some function that, that takes as input the five guys that are on the floor and gives you as output some quantification of that lineup success. Uh, you can choose lots and lots and lots of possible quantifications of success. Uh, but just for simplicity, uh, we're going to deal today with, with just a simple raw plus minus, so points scored minus points allowed. Okay. All right, so here's my, my analogy to, to the beginning here. Well, uh, what we've got is a function on lineups. And in a pretty natural way, uh, lineups uh, can be thought of as permutations. And those permutations are a group. They, they, there's a mathematical structure there which is completely analogous to the, the days of the year analogy that we, that we looked at before. Um, with, with one uh, complication, which is that the mathematical structure of that group of permutations is, is um, annoyingly more complicated than, than this one over here. So that's something that we have to, we have to deal with. Um, but once you deal with it, it turns out that there's a completely natural basis, just like those periodic functions that we use to understand births per day of the year. There's a natural basis that you can use to break that function on lineups down. Okay, so those are the anal analogs of those periodicities that we looked at before. Um, and I think the same idea uh, applies that applied before. If we expand that function in a new basis, it's conceivable that there's some insight that we might be able to find um, passing over into this, into this new basis. Now, of course, um, insight comes from interpretability. So those, those periodic functions, are, are, they have this nice interpretation of, of sort of periodic cycles through the year. So what uh, what are the, what is the interpretation of these functions on lineups? Okay, and so uh, I I claim that that the interpretation is particularly well suited to answer this basketball question that we, we wanted to think about. Okay, so the data analytic interpretation of these functions uh, is is these are the sort of uh, mathematical terms, but here's here's what it means in terms of basketball. So, so one is that those functions naturally quantify group effects. So just like we were talking about, uh, if you're interested in the contribution from a group of two or a group of three, accounting for the contributions of all the higher and, and lower order groups that comprise or circumscribe that particular group, um, they're there. 
Uh, moreover, the, the effects that we're going <clears> to, <throat> the group effects that we're going to talk about and we're going to quantify um, are, are naturally orthogonal. So what that, that just means sort of perpendicular. So if you're thinking about um, like principal components analysis or something, um, they're, they're not muddied together. So, so when you talk about the Steph Curry, Clay Thompson effect, you have separated out the individual contributions of those guys and you've separated out the potential contributions from, from higher order groups as well. Okay. <clears throat> so this was our analogy that we started with where you can pass from the time domain uh, into the frequency domain uh, and, and uncover insight into that signal by finding those periodicities. And uh, we're gonna do exactly that now for our lineup data. So here, here's the actual data uh, that, that I'm using in this particular uh, talk. So I'm using play-by-play uh, -play data um, from the 2015-16 season, which is just what we were looking at when we started writing code. Um, so, so just to refresh your memory, that was the year that the Warriors were, were really awfully good, but, but um, lost, I think as someone said, to LeBron James in the NBA Finals. Um, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna take take um, take play by play data and aggregate it so that we have this lineup plus minus for every lineup, and we're we're fixing every team's roster to be 15 players. So what we do is we just cast off the if they if they used more than 15 players over the course of the season, we're only gonna take the top 15 players in terms of usage and, and get rid of any lineups that included those other guys that, that were low usage. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, there are 15 choose 5 possible lineups. So that's like 3,003 uh, possible lineups out there. Uh, and most teams uh, will use fewer than 10% of those possible lineups. So if you just ask for, for how many lineups that had at least one possession, for, for most teams, it's, it's pretty darn close to about 300 total lineups. Um, and then it, it, uh, the number of lineups that get used drops off pretty, pretty dramatically. So uh, if you ask for how many lineups played more than 10 possessions, you're in the neighborhood of only about 125 lineups, and only about 30 lineups uh, that play more than 50 possessions. All right, so there's my function. So there's my function that's just looking at the 3,003 possible lineups and measuring uh, the, the raw plus minus for each of those lineups. So lots of zeros in there. Um, and we're going to try to move into some new domain where we might uh, have some insight or gain some insight into how these things work. Uh, so <clears throat> this is what we're going to get. Um, so this is kind of the... the Fourier analysis analog here of this uh, lineup decomposition. So what we're going to get is contributions of individuals, okay? contributions of pairs, threes, fours, and full five-player lineups. Okay? So these are sort of the, the analogs of those periodicities um, that we saw before uh, in the context of, of understanding lineups. Okay. So let me... Uh, <clears throat> show you some better pictures here. All right, so let's let's just pull up third order effects. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to filter on groups of three, okay, uh, that have at least 200 possessions. So we're we're trying to to look at groups that actually saw some playing time where we might be able to to um, make some some um, see some some real data and not just noise. Okay, so uh, that's Boston. So that's the 2015-16 Celtics. Um, and those are uh, all of the groups of three that um, saw more than 200 possessions. And this is their, their sort of, their sort of um, Fourier coefficient, so the spike on that group of three. And so you can see that there are, there are some good spikes and there are some bad spikes and, and lots in between. Uh, and that's the Golden State Warriors from that year also the third order effect space. Uh, so you can see that the Warriors had, had this in, impressively dominant group of three uh, as compared to, say, uh, what Boston's group of three looks like. All right. 
So uh, you can probably guess who that group of three is. Uh, <laughs> tell you, tell you in a minute. Um, and then here's the the second order effect space. And so you can see again, um, you know, the warriors the warriors have these these um, really strong contributions coming from certain groups of two. Uh, the Celtics have some have some some good contributions as well, but but nothing uh, nothing quite as dominant as as over here. Um, also, interestingly, there are some pretty there are some considerably negative contributions as well. So those are indications of groups of players. So if you have a, a, a pretty big negative spike, that's a pairing where you're really not getting anything from that pairing aside from the individual contributions of those two players. So after you account for the individual contributions, there's there's not not anything there. That's that's what that's saying. <coughs> All right. Um, so here's an example um, of the uh, you know of the picture that I just showed you for the Warriors in, in these uh, in this second <coughs> order space. Um, and what we've done here is is taken um, uh, the 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 sort of spectral contribution. Okay, so that's basically this Fourier coefficient, um, and we've we've divided uh, sort of normalized by log of possessions. So you can sort of think of this as a sort of contribution from this pair uh, per log of possessions. And so again, the number of possessions is, is dramatically different uh, for different groups. So this just sort of gives us a way of normalizing a little bit. <clears throat> and on the right hand side here, these are the actual number of possessions. So you can see, uh, you know, like this, this particular uh, pairing of, of Barbosa with Ian Clark, you know, they were only out there for 325 possessions versus uh, 5,000 possessions nearly for Draymond Green and Steph Curry. Um, but again, you can see that, that um, not surprisingly, there's a, a, a pretty uh, impressive um, higher second order correlation between players like Draymond Green and Steph Curry, Curry and Thompson. Maybe interesting that, that Green and Curry pair slightly better than, than uh, Curry and Thompson do. Um, uh, and <clears throat> you can look down here for, for sort of negative contributions. And um, this is sort of an interesting one, I thought. So 1,400 possessions is a lot of possessions. Uh, and uh, Clay Thompson and Sean Livingston were sort of particularly poor pairing. So those guys just, something about the way their game works doesn't quite fit together. Um, and that's kind of interesting to think about. So you might think about why that is and if you sort of think about that for a little bit, it might, might make sense. Um, okay. Uh, Clay Thompson with Leandro Barbosa, similarly, it was just sort of epically bad for the Warriors. That was like a, a, a really poor, poor pair. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so um, a couple of interesting, uh, interesting pairings from that 15-16 season that I thought were worth pointing out. Um, Andrew Bogut. Andrew Bogut's an interesting player for the Warriors that year. He was, he was an extremely neutral player. He didn't pair particularly well or particularly poorly with lots of groups. Um, he, he, he paired particularly poorly with Andre Iguodala, so that's something interesting to think about. Um, Clay Thompson uh, really, really didn't work well with a lot of the Warriors reserves that year, um, whereas Bogut paired well with Curry, so, so Bogut Curry was a particularly, um, uh, I'm sorry, Bogut Thompson was a particularly better pairing than Bogut Curry. And uh, Barbosa and Livingston, the two reserve guards, um, both paired pretty well with, with Maurice Spates, who was a, a sort of reserve big for the Warriors, um, where, whereas the, the starting guards didn't, didn't pair nearly as well with Spates. So these are, these are sort of things to consider. All right. Um, so here's a picture. Uh, just to kind of reframe some of this information. So what I'm gonna, so this is Cleveland, okay? So this is the Cavs. Oh, and I think on the last slide I, I didn't mention, but um, it was, it's interesting that, that LeBron, uh, who, who, you know, is, is clearly uh, the, the, the best individual contributor, um, paired really well with Kevin Love and, and not so well with Kyrie Irving. Um, 
So that's just something interesting to think about. Now, Kyrie Irving did have some, some injury issues that year, so it's not maybe not completely fair, but uh, that's just a number that, that stuck out. Um, so here, here's a, uh, another picture of the second order effects, uh, so these pair groupings for Cleveland. Um, and so the, the picture here is um, uh, on the x-axis, so this is just the, the raw plus minus per divided by log of possessions, okay? So this is raw plus minus normalized by log of possessions. This is that spectral contribution normalized by log of possessions, okay? And then the points are colored by how many possessions they played. So that's log of possessions on the color, uh, color side. Um, so I think the interesting takeaway here would be one, um, there's definitely a, a, a fairly reasonable correlation between raw plus minus and spectral contribution, which I would argue is a good thing. Um, it would be pretty surprising if, if, um, if, if there was no correlation between these two things. I mean, you want to see that this is reflecting team success in some meaningful way. Um, on the other hand, uh, as, you, as you get into some of these lesser used, now these are all still filtered, so there's at least 200 possessions in, in each of these points, so they, they are seeing playing time. As you get into some of these lesser used um, lineup pairs, um, if you fix a particular plus minus, there's considerable variability in that spectral contribution. So the idea being that, that if you're just looking at something like plus minus and you're trying to use it to figure out whether or not that's a good pairing, well, you've got, you've got all of these, these pairings to consider. They all sort of look the same from the perspective of plus minus, um, but some of them are, are considerably better as pairings once you account for individual contributions, uh, and some are considerably worse. And so this might be useful for you in terms of, of how you think about, understand, and try to build uh, uh, good lineups with, with um, uh, good efficiencies. Okay. Um, it's, it's not surprising that, that coaches understand and play their, their best players uh, a lot. That's the same picture where, where uh, I've swapped out the, the x-axis to be possessions. So you can see that, that there's, there's a whole lot of variability uh, in terms of, of how much these particular groups play. So in terms of, of how correlated these things are, um, the, the R squared, for example, between the spectral contribution and raw plus minus is about 0.46. So correlated, but, but not, not too correlated. All right. um, here's the Warriors. So you get a similar picture for the Warriors pairs, groups of two for the Warriors. Uh, so possessions on the x-axis here, raw plus minus here. And again, as you get into some of these, these um, lesser used lineups, um, quite a bit of variability in terms of whether or, not, um, whether or not you actually have a good pairing or not. Um, so this is third order effects. So these would be looking at pure groups of three. So Cleveland, Boston, Golden State, and Houston. Um, so Houston that year was pretty close to a 500 team, uh, and that was the sort of Dwight Howard debacle here. Um, so uh, you can see there that, that, that there's you know, uh, a lot of variability, especially in terms of, of which groups played. Um, so you know, you've got some pretty poor, uh, poor groups of three that, that saw considerable playing time that year. Um, so just to, to, to touch on, on one uh, thought about how you might use this. Um, so how do you use Sean Livingston effectively if you're the Warriors? Okay. So what you might do is you might look for these pairings that are particularly strong. So those are sort of the, the reddish ones um, where you feel like you're, you're Getting, you're getting something uh, beyond just the individual contributions for these particular pairings. Then there are a couple of neutral pairings that, that you know, don't add much but, but aren't, in fact, negative. And then the blue ones are the ones that you might uh, think twice about. Those are ones where um, really the, the success of that 
of that pair is due to the individual contributions and not, not the pair. Okay. So that's a picture, um, just the same picture we looked at before, but, but particularly for Sean Livingston in groups of two and groups of three. Um, and you can see there that, that there, there does seem to be uh, a suggestion of some underutilized groups or pairs that, that might better maximize the value of those players. Um, so those, for example, groups of three up there um, are, are pretty close to that minimum 200 possession uh, threshold, um, but they seem to be reasonably good in terms of plus minus, and they seem to be um, pretty good in terms of their spectral contribution as well. So that suggests that there are, there are some groups of three um, that you might have used differently or played more um, that, that would have, in fact, maximized the value of those players. All right, so conclusion. Um, so what, uh, what I hope uh, is that this idea of, of looking at these spectral contributions is a way to help understand um, something that's pretty hard to quantify in general, which is this idea of what it means to have a synergistic lineup or what it means to have team chemistry. Uh, it correlates reasonably with team success, at least measured by raw plus minus, which as we saw before is, is in fact highly, highly correlated with wins. So, so one hopes that you can at least disaggregate that a little bit and, and, and learn something there. Um, I'm not even going to mention what that says. Um, uh, another thing that you can do if you go on Basketball Reference and you pull up, um, Basketball Reference has all of these lineup efficiencies. You can look at pairs and triples and, and groups of three and four. Um, but I think that, that this helps you do deep dives into those lineup compositions um, while avoiding erroneous attribution through co collinearity. So what this basically does is it says, uh, I'm going to help you pull out LeBron James' individual contribution before we look at groups of two and, and see who's actually adding value there. Okay. Um, if we had more time, you could see how you might try to stack these positive groups to maximize lineup power. So if you can take um, a really good group of two um, and put that inside a really good group of three and put that inside a really good group of four, you've got sort of a, a way of building strong lineups. Uh, and, and if you do sort of a, a, um, a little bit of a statistical analysis of these, of these things, they're pretty well behaved. So if you if you say take a team and, and bootstrap a thousand seasons um, using their actual data, uh, those spectral contributions have have pretty nice properties. They're stable, so they're not you know they are they are um, um, representing something real and not just just reacting to noise. Um, and then finally, there's interesting questions like like whether you you might be able to understand what it means for a team to be good. Um, by looking at some of this spectral information. Um, and I, I guess one uh, parting thought is just that I, I, I talked mostly about groups of two and three. Um, and I, I did that partially just because it's easier to do, but, but also because it, it really does seem like that is where you kind of get the biggest bang for your buck. So the, the um, the contributions of pairs and, and groups of three is, is sort of bigger than what you might expect in, in some something that you might call random basketball. So there really is something to, to these groups of two and three as, as particularly important to your team uh, being good. So thank you. We're right at 11.15, so if there's one quick question, we we'll probably take that. So could you use this to help figure out uh, draft picks before they start uh, playing? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so so I, I think that um, at, at this stage of the game, I would say that this is, this is a good way of, of sort of helping to understand how to use the resources that you have. Um, it's, it's, it's not super easy to, to make comparisons across different teams. I think there's, there's ways to, to make that work, but I, don't, I, don't, I haven't done it yet. Yeah, thank you.